Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so we're just we're here today for Peter Glazer's talk about geophotography. So just want to welcome everybody. My name is Louise Coburn. I'm the vice chair of the Tynawee branch of the Geographical Association. Um, this event, everyone is welcome to it. Our events are free, whether you're a GA member or not. We would obviously welcome donations. Um, and if you contact Amy, the email addresses will come up shortly. Um, if you contact Amy, if you're interested in giving a donation, and obviously we would also encourage everybody to join the Geographical Association. Um, we're very keen to hear about topics that you would be interested in, and that, that would be very useful for us in planning our lecture series. You'll see the contact details on the slide, so please get in touch with any requests or any comments that you have relating to the talks or talks you would like to see in future. Um, I would also just like to mention the GA's Ge uh, Geography Education Online on their website. It's very useful for years 12 and 13, especially for catching up on materials that's been missed during the lockdown and obviously last year and also this year as well. Materials and services are excellent quality and they are cheaper if you're a GA member. Um, audience wise, it would be lovely for the. Please feel free to leave your cameras on. Um, what I will do is rather if, if you would like to ask questions, if you can pop in the chat uh, rather than us stopping the talk, if you put them on the chat, then what that means is I'll collate them at the end and we'll have um, a question and answer session at the end. And that's a good way of doing that. Certificate wise, we also give out certificates for attendance. So if anybody is interested and would like a certificate, then if you can email um, the information that will, I'm wondering if Carl, if you could put this. Um, fantastic, lovely, thank you very much. So on here, you've got um, my email address, which is louisemollycoburn at gmail.com. If you'd like a certificate, please get in touch and I'll make sure you get a certificate of attendance sent out. And finally, just before handing over, um, I would like to introduce Peter Glade for his lecture today about geophotography, how geophotography reflects and influences our change in geography. So a bit of background about Peter before um, he starts his talk. Peter was the principal lecturer in environmental assessment and management at Greenwich University from 1992 to 2006. He then worked part-time as a deputy director at the Biodiversity History and Landscape Research Institute from 2006 to 2009 as well as being a principal lecturer in the Department of Environment at Manchester Metropolitan University from 2007 to 2010. Uh, Peter has also been the Associate Professor of Environmental Management and Director of Enterprise and External Engagement at Northumbria University from 2010 until April 2020. And Peter now works as a Sustainability and Environmental Management Advisor, providing specialist training lecturing and mentoring in aspects of environmental management, sustainable development, conflict management and community empowerment. With that vast wealth of experience that Peter has is today going to be talking to us about geophotography. So with that in mind, geophotography is unique in how it's been documented and it obviously documents our changing world over the last 150 years. It has also changed society because photographs have changed social attitudes to a, re a vast range of issues. For example, from the Vietnam War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, to Black Lives Matter protests more recently, and the current climate crisis. It's part of our daily life. We have 50 million photographs uploaded to Facebook each hour as an example of obviously how much photos are used in society today. And this lecture then looks at geophotography this being the ways that photography and photographers interact with geography. And it asks the question, what do the photographs I take and the way I use these photographs say about the geography of my world? And with that in mind, I would like to hand over to Peter, who will obviously give us this very interesting talk today. Thank you very much, Peter. Hello, um, thanks for coming along today. If you bear with me a moment whilst I try to share my talk screen with you. There we go. 
So you've been given a little bit of background about me and what I do as a geographer. At the same time, I have for many years been working as a photographer. I teach photography, I take, I take photographs professionally and in my everyday life. Look, I've got a camera, there you go. Um, I was that photo nerd at school who went into the dark room and took pictures. And I'm really interested in the way in which the images we take and we see in our daily life impact on the geography of the world around us. Now, I was wondering a couple of weeks ago how to start this lecture and what might illustrate the link between photography and modern day geography. And then luckily we had the 6th of January and what happened in Washington, where I am invading the capital of my country, but yet simultaneously, it's important I take selfies with the police, or in this case, get the police to join me in taking a photograph of the event. And I use those images to document the illegal activity I'm doing. So here's one of the examples in the news, Jenna, we're on our flight to freedom, uploaded um, the window of the Capitol. If news doesn't stop lying about us, we're going to be coming to their news studios next. And in a now deleted Facebook video, we are going to effing go in there, life or death, it doesn't matter. All of this makes it quite useful when as the police you want to try and prosecute, in this case, uh, the guy who was uh, pushing on the door and crushing the police officers part of it. This desire to take images of ourself in the world as part of our daily life, this selfie idea, it's been argued by some, is so much part of our normal daily activity, it's almost second nature, even when you're carrying out, as in this case, something that could be called terrorism. So photography is part of our everyday life. It's something that most people listening and watching this talk will take photos, probably on their phone, on a daily basis. They will document their lives. They will upload it to others. Why are we doing that with this visual media? What's it say about us? Is it new? Is it old? How does that link into our personal geography and more generally the geography of the whole world around us? Well, this desire to take images of ourselves goes back to the very origins of photography. This photograph here was taken by a guy called Robert Cornelius in 1939, and it is the first known, still surviving, photographic self-portrait. Slightly different to our photograph with that, in that it took a good few minutes for the photograph to be taken. He put the material into the camera, removed the camera lens, went round the other side, sat there for tens of minutes, walked back, put the lens cap on, then developed that image. But he wanted to photograph himself. We could call it perhaps the first selfie. If we look through over time, the technology we use to take images and show images and the type of images that we take has changed, but yet we are still taking photographs of ourselves. And if we look at some of those images that we take of ourselves over time, it might tell us something about our changing geographical perception of ourself. So let's look at some sample images of different dates and different times. Oh, hello. Okay, this is an early photograph from, we're looking back here in the 1840s, typical Victorian gentleman. You could see that as a painting, couldn't you? Very formal, very much to display, to show to yourselves as part of your house that's there. A little bit later, this is towards the 1880s, um, we're trying to look cool now, aren't we? We're a bit more relaxed photo that's there. Um, it's not just the person, there's a bit more information around them, they're leaning on something. You could take that pose and see it in a modern catalog showing clothing or selling clothing that's there. Moving into the early 1900s, 
um, again, different type of photos, more relaxed, more personal, more individual, less formal. Going to the 1960s, we're looking at snapshots, aren't we? We're documenting our lives. This couple may have been going out for an evening's do. It's no longer the formal portrait taken by someone else. We're starting to take our own photographs of us. When you get through to the 1970s and 60s, photography is so cheap, so quick, that kids can do it. It's not just adults, it's not an expensive thing, it's open to everybody. When we look at the 1970s and how people show themselves in photographs, perhaps compared to now, there's a slight change here in terms of body image, isn't there? That we're looking perhaps at aspects of the geography of the body, the way we show ourselves, and the way that photographic images put pressure on people to photograph and illustrate themselves in certain ways. So photography is both illustrating us, but the images we see in the media also influence how we take photographs. It's a two-way relationship between the two of them. And photography does have impacts on the world around us. Um, this is an article from five years ago and the classic quote that more people died in uh, 2015 from selfies than died from shark attacks. Whilst that is true, it's not a lot of them. But that desire to take the more interesting selfie of you in that exotic position, um, I will admit, I wouldn't take that photograph that this person's standing in that position, that scares the hell out of me. Other impacts in terms of photographs on geography and the world around us can be illustrated by the people's desire to take photographs with other species, animal selfies. I don't know if any of you have seen this animal in, uh, on any of your social media sites. I can never pronounce it, it's Quacka, I believe is the name that's there. It's a very cute Australian marsupial. It only lives on certain islands and people want to have the photograph taken with it. That presence of all these people around is actually changing the behavior of that organism. The desire to be photographed in beautiful places puts pressure on the environment and could cause environmental damage. Other impacts on the environment, I don't know if anyone saw this, it was about five years ago. This is the first known animal selfie. A natural history photographer put a camera out in the wild and this animal playing with the camera because it was interested in it took its photograph of itself. It then turned into a law case because this image that you see on screen went round the world, appeared in lots of newspapers. Now, if the photographer owns a copyright, he would have earned over a half a million pounds from that image. The people, conservationists who own the nature reserve, argued that the monkey, the ape, owned the, owned the photo, and therefore the money should go to that animal and the conservation group of the area. And it became a law case of, is an animal a legal entity under the law and therefore can own copyright of its own photo? At which point your head's going to explode and where the heck is this talk going to go? Well, that's the introduction. Let me go to my first slide. It's a bit like TV programmes, we're now going to the credits. What I want to do for the remaining time, which is about 40, 45 minutes, is look at this link between photography as part of geography and geography and the way in which photography plays a part within it, this two-way relationship. I want to look at how photographs reflect our changing geography and also can influence and lead to change in that geography of the world around us. 40 odd minutes, five things I want to try and cover with you in that time. How we've used photography, I've begun to explore that and how photography links to geography. Secondly, how photography is affecting the geography of our world, both social geography, human geography and the physical geography. I'll then say a little bit about what photography is. I don't want to pull out one or two historic and modern day geophotography examples to show this link between image, photograph, geography, world, us. And last but not least, to touch a little bit about where we are now and how photographic images 
and the images that we personally take affect the world around us and reflect the world around us. So that's the plan for the time that we've got. Some of this material may be familiar to at least one person who's listening, which is uh, Mike Jeffries, hello, um, because I used to teach a whole module with him uh, as part of the undergraduate degree at Northumbria University. Um, so I'm gonna cover in half an hour or so something we'd cover across a whole year with the students. It's gonna be quick. And if you get bored, don't worry, there'll be a new topic and a new image coming up because we tend to look at images very quickly. It's a quick way of understanding and observing the world. So that's the plan of action for today. Now, I want to start though by asking you to do something for me. I would imagine that most of you have somewhere near you, your mobile phone. I would imagine that most of you use your mobile phone to take photos and take images. So I want to take a couple of minutes as part of today's session to get you to look at your own photographs and those images that you take. And to do that, I'm gonna go into the chat function um, and we'll use that to help a little bit that's there. So I've got some questions for you at this point. Question number one, how many of you take pictures or photographs with a phone or a camera? And how many of you see yourself as a photographer? Now, it's a pity you were, we're not in the room together. I would imagine that most of you would say that you take pictures. I've got a couple of nods from the people on screen. I would imagine, however, that most of you don't see yourself as a photographer. That's something a professional person does. So what's the difference of someone who takes pictures with one of these or with one of these and someone who is a photographer? I'll come back to that a little bit later on. The questions I want you to have a go at doing now for me is, can you take a minute and have a scroll through the images on your mobile phone? And can you look at those images and see what type of images you're taking? Is it family? Is it places? Is it particular objects? Is there particular reasons for doing this? So can you just take a minute, scroll down on your phone, and if anyone's willing, put some comments in telling me the type of things or the type of categories of things that you take photographs of. Okay. Holidays, family, scenery. Ooh. Okay, so pretty places, nature and family. So is it rural, animals, nature, friends, family? Ah, I took something to send to a particular person. So I'm taking photographs to show people. Brilliant. That's really good. Anyone taking photographs for different reasons? Couple of new messages coming on. Lots of family, grandchildren, Recipes, so sharing information photographically, places, pets, landscape, family, friends. Okay, wow, brilliant. Thank you all for interacting at this point. Screenshots of emails, oh good Lord, yes, those count. Things to show others. Um, ice patterns in my garden, so is that because it's geographically it's about ice and how it's formed, or is it also because it's pretty, it's beautiful. I looked at my phone earlier and the images that I'd taken, and amongst those ones, I had um, electricity and gas meters, so for taking readings of things. I scroll back and historically lots of photographs of roads to remind me where I'd parked the car. Things I find interesting. So, 
a lot of you are classifying what you take a photograph of, but if you remember your geographers, and in the, if anyone attended the previous sessions when we talked about studying geography and images, there are a series of questions you ask as a geographer, aren't they? What am I taking photographs of? Where have I taken that photograph? Why have I taken that photograph? How, etc. We can apply those geographical analytical ideas to photographic images as well. So why are you taking photographs of your family? Why do you take photographs when you're away on holiday? Why are you taking photographs of ice patterns, of things you've seen, of places you've been, recording things to work, sharing information? Are you taking those images just for you? Or are you taking those images because you want to keep them for the future to share it with someone else? Is it a process about self? Is it a process that involves other people geographically as well? What is photography about? What does it involve? Now, if we had a lot more time, I'd get you to explore and we could run a workshop on how you use photography, what's it mean? What do your photographs say about your own personal geography? Of the world around us and the way we interact with it and how we respond to it. Here's a photographer saying what, what photography means to them if I pull in about. Garlic and the question we have this week is what is photography? That's a heck of a question. I feel it's more than capturing images to help remember the past. It's a new way of thinking and looking. If you embrace photography as a lifestyle you'll get much more pleasure out of your day. Now, when you look at a garden or a street scene, you will see light and shadow. You'll be able to appreciate texture and color and hue. In short, you'll be much more aware of your surroundings and live a fuller life because of it. This, to me, is the greatest gift that photography brings to people. And I think it's in part one of the reasons so many people want to get more from their photography experience. Photography is not your camera or your lens. Those are just tools that capture light and transform it into an editable form. Yes, some of that gear is pretty impressive, but it's not what gives a photographer the ability to get amazing shots. The thing that you must understand is that photography is all about you and how you see the world. It's about understanding what you want to say regardless of your subject matter. It's about slowing down your hectic day and stepping into a calm, meditative state. Okay. Let's pull back a little bit from that. It's the photographer not talking purely in a geography sense, he's talking as an artist. But it is about why am I taking this image? What is it that is of interest to me? Or what is it I want to share with someone else? And geography and geographers can take photographic images and interpret what that means about the person who takes it nowadays, because the images you select say an enormous amount about you as a person. And if that's true, the images we've inherited from our parents and grandparents allow us to understand their personal geography as well. That's what I want to explore today. I'm going to use some global images that have had an impact on the world, but I also want to explore a little bit about what your images and what your family images might say about their lives, about the changing geography around us as well. I used to teach um, adult classes in photography and I had a wonderful example of a woman who came in and we looked at all her photographs and we asked her to look for common themes. And, what she eventually realised is none of the photographs had her husband in. Um, she got divorced fairly soon afterwards because um, it was saying she's selecting to pick images she wanted to take and exclude the things she didn't want in her life. That's quite interesting. So I want to take this a little bit further and explore as a geographer some of these ideas and themes. Now, this is something you can do on your own. I would imagine all of you have in a cupboard somewhere boxes of family collection of photos. I've pulled out a folder here. And amongst this, I've got 
various images. Oh, look, here's some photographs of family weddings we've got. Um, anyone remember True Prints going back to the print companies? 70s, 80s, 90s. I've got some old black and white photographs. Some of these, let's look at the date, 1950, 1940. I've got here, a photograph of my great grandfather, which was taken uh, during the First World War. Can you see his army regalia? I've got even older photographs in here. Um, this one comes in its own little book. And if I flip the lid over, you might see it's got a gold frame to it. This one dates from about 1860. That record of family collection of photographs is a record of two things. One, as a geographer, we can look at what is photographed and that will allow us to understand historical geography in terms of places 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago, the spaces people lived in, the places they lived in. But we could also think about why those photographs were taken and presented. And that might help us understand the culture and the society and the geography of those places. I'm going to throw a little bit of theory at you now. Don't worry, there's not a lot today. There's a poet and writer called Jared Manley Hopkins, and he argues we live in two worlds as a geographer or as a human. The first world is the exterior landscape around us which we will live in a certain place because we like it. We will decorate our bedrooms and houses with pictures, photographs that represent what we like, what we're interested in. So we will modify that external landscape. But the reason why we put up photographs of say, musicians we like or pictures of holidays is because it reflects the internal world within our head what Jeremy Manley Hopkins calls the inscape, our attitudes, our values, what we like, what we don't like, the image we want to present to the world, your classic selfie with the puckered lips and the classic view that you've got is because you want to give that image to other people because you want to be shown in that way. So there's a link here between what we think and our attitudes and the world we experience and how that changes the world and how our experience of the world changes our attitudes. It's two-way dynamic. And that's very much about geography, geography of culture, geography of place, space, geography of body, lots of themes that you'll cover in your subjects. Now, the way we use photography sometimes evolves and changes slowly and sometimes changes really, really quickly. I'm gonna show you two photographs here separated by less than 10 years, I'd like you to see if you can spot the difference between these two images. Now, what's different in the bottom image to the one on top? These are both in Rome, at the Vatican, and an audience with the Pope. By 2013, we wanted to use our camera, our iPad, our phone to document our experience of that place. 2005, everyone is just in that moment. So why have we changed that? Why have we changed the way we experience and share the world? And how is that change in behavior reflected in the images we take and the way we share and use those images? Now, it's really important because nowadays, in the, what, um, 20 minutes or so I spent talking to you, millions of photographs will have been uploaded. But what is a million? What's it mean? Well, here's a way of illustrating this. This is a church in Germany, and this was an artist called Eric Kessels. And what he did is he went to one of the um, social media sites, it's not one of the big ones, and he downloaded all of the images uploaded in 24 hours, printed them and filled the church with them. 
That what you see in front of you is 24 hours in one media website of images uploaded by us because we want to share that image with someone else. Why? What's that say? What's this photograph about? Now that sounds brilliant because at one extreme, it means we are taking many more photographs to show the world around us. So that should mean future generations of geographers will have this brilliant resource of the 2000s, the 2010s, and the world changing. The only problem is, how many of you, when you've taken a photograph on that, then print it out as an image, which someone in the future can dig out from the archive, find that image of that place and do something with? Or how many of you, in terms of your images, just keep them in your phone? And what happens when you upload to a new phone or a different custom and suddenly realise that that photo, which purely exists on the camera or in the cloud, is lost? And as technology changes, there's a risk that the photographs we've taken, if we do not save them in a way that future generations will be able to use and access, that all our images will be lost. We could have got a generation where we're taking millions of photos or billions, but we're not actually saving them for the future, or for future geographers, because they just exist here. When you, if you died, your family hasn't got a, necessarily access to your images and your photos it's yours and the company i um apple say who you have rented the space from that's a bit depressing isn't it let's do something more positive how do photographs change society that was the next big thing to talk about how many of you seen this image of the earth from space The small blue dot idea. Imagine you were back in the 1960s, the generation that for the first time saw an image of the Earth from space. The idea that everyone who lives, all of the countries of the world, exist on this single blue dot of a planet. The overview effect is a change in global attitudes. It's interesting that going to space and the first images of the Earth from space coincide in the 1960s with the rise of the environmental movement at that point in time. It's hard to argue about environmental harm if you can see we're on one small planet. Other photographs that have had an impact. These are the last, I think, depressing ones I'm going to show. Nelson Mandela being released from prison, the Vietnam War. Some of you may remember this photograph of Alan Kurdi, the Turkish child, uh, the sorry, Syrian refugee child who was killed on trying to get across the Mediterranean, washed up on the beach in Turkey, I think about three years ago. Seeing those images can lead to countries, societies, the globe changing its attitudes because images have a power that text on its own doesn't have. Other images with global impacts, however, can be less obvious. These are two photographs, which are some of the most important globally, how and why. I'm gonna come back to that at the very end of the talk. I'll leave you wondering. Spoiler, yay. So most photographs we take are about our personal geography. It could be your Victorian ancestors, that is one very scary family, or perhaps the holiday photographs that your parents or grandparents took in the 1960s or 70s, or perhaps the more recent photographs your family's taken and printed out. Interesting, photographs of pregnancy. If you go back a few decades, pregnant women didn't really appear in photographs. It was not an acceptable thing to do. Changing body image at this point is quite interesting. I'd also argue that photographs can change us. This image taken during the first Q80 war 
was taken by a guy called Sebastian Solidago. Here's what he looks at. Um, he looks a bit like the baddie in Thunderbirds the Hood, one of the most and best photographs uh, photographers in the world in the last 50 years. He spent his life photographing. This was a uh, rare metal mine in Brazil, um, rainforest destruction also in Brazil, lots of wars. And he found that this really documenting harm, he couldn't take photographs anymore. It really destroyed his ability to take images. And he stopped taking photographs for a few years. And then he was asked to take photographs of nature as a series for a book called Genesis. And through taking photographs of nature in an unharmed way, led him to buying a farm in Brazil here in 2001 and planting several million trees to restore the rainforest. His experience of photographs led him to change his view of the world and as a result, do something different at a big scale. All the money from these photographs has now gone to recreating rainforests. In the same way round, photography is something that can bring us together. Does anyone remember the photographs in Australia of the fires? and the water being given to the marsupials. The fall of uh, Saddam Hussein, or perhaps the image of Usain Bolt winning his Olympic record. A common picture that we can all share, a shared experience. But also photography separates us from other people. It can lead to shared moments and shared understanding, but it can also be a barrier. Has anyone been to a gig? Anyone remember gigs a year or so ago and been really annoyed because all you can see is that? If I'm spending the concert, taking the image, sending it to my friends, getting an email back, videoing it, am I actually in that moment or am I seeing that moment through the other side of the screen? I'm separated. Here's an example of how photography can separate. This was a family who I met in the West Bank, Israel, Palestine, whatever you want to define it. Their house had been demolished by the Israeli military because they argued it had been illegally built. That was six days before I took this photo. And as I was talking to the lady, I asked permission to take a photograph. Another person came along less than a meter and a half from her face and just did that. She wasn't treating that person as a person, just as an object to be photographed. The image allows us to separate from the world. The screen separates us from that problem. I was out there doing a project about photography of the school kids, go back, stay there. And what we did was something different. We took a Polaroid camera. We got the kids lined up to take images. We then gave them the photo and they watched the color of the image of themselves appear and that photo was theirs. That's photography sharing rather than photography separating. It's a very different thing. Let's look at how photography can change geography. This was an installation by a photographer called JR, nothing to do with Dallas. And he makes huge photographic images. Anyone been to the Louvre in Paris? You recognize a triangle in the middle he basically could cover that triangle with a photograph of the image behind. He then created a photographic image as if the Louvre was in a giant hole in the ground. That's manipulating geography to get to see in a different way. You could walk across that image, that photo. You could share it. It's the most extraordinary experience. How about the way geography shows changing worlds? You must have seen images like this, Glacier 1941 in the bottom, 2004 in the top. Or perhaps Newcastle Keys, 1880, Newcastle Keys now. That is documenting geography and its changes, whereas the others are showing how geography can change the world around us. So I've got 15, 20 minutes now to try and explore some aspects of this. And I've been talking now for nearly half an hour, but I haven't actually said what job photography is. What is it? 
How can we look at it as a geographer? How can we understand it? Well, if we take the origin of the word photography, we can split it into photo and graphy. Photo is light, graphy or graphene is drawing. Photography is capturing light and drawing with that light, that image, fixing it. It is the process of producing images digitally on a, or chemically. It's the process of taking those images. It's the work produced by photographers. Now that's very technical. Here's a slightly alternative view for you. A photograph is something which involves three different elements. The intent. I want to take this image of my family, of this view, of this recipe. Why do I want to take it? The second part is the action of taking that images. The third part is me looking at it and or sharing it. Photography is about the image I take, the target, the person who takes it, the operator, the photographer, but also you're usually doing that for someone else, a third person, a spectator. Why do I want to share this? What do I want to share? What is it I'm showing to the world around us? That's really the interesting bit and the main thing I'll focus on in the remaining time. So I'm not gonna do this, Here's a history of photography in terms of cameras and technology. I'm going to do it in a different way of how photography technologically is linked to how societies change and how we use and take photos. Isn't it interesting that for the third time in 2009, the biggest camera company on our high streets, Jessup, went bankrupt again because people have stopped buying cameras and film as technology evolves, so have we. So, some examples to show you. What's photography about? Well, it's two things. It involves a lens and that image being focused on something else and involving light sensitive chemicals or now light sensitive um, digital technology to fix that image. All of this evolved before photographs could be taken. Camera obscura goes back to 4BC, light sensitive chemicals. We know the Chinese BC were using them. Shroud of Turin might be photochemical as well. But the first photographs that occurred and the first history of geophotography goes back to the 17, 1800s. Um, scientists like Schultz in the 1700s showed that letters uh, could lead to chemical reactions or uh, in liquids. Wedgwood, the guy who made pottery, used photochemicals to have temporary images on plates to allow designs to be fixed. It's only though in the 1820s that we began to produce images that could be permanently fixed and passed on to others. And this is the earliest known surviving photograph the actual image is on the bottom here. It's hard to see. Here's a better image at the top. It's a view from the guy's window. Nipchi. What's interesting with this, it took over eight hours for the image to be taken. And actually, if you look, can you see the sunlight shining on this wall? And the sunlight also shining on that wall because the sun was here and moved across to there in the time it took for the image to be taken. Early photography was incredibly complicated and incredibly difficult. And we use these early images for very different things. Early photography was taking images to represent what people wanted photographs for, of nice views, pretty buildings, themselves, their family. Although interestingly, how many of you, when I asked for your list of things you take photographs of, said family, friends, holiday, nature. We still take photographs of the same thing. Here's the guy who made it all easy to do. This is a guy called Daguerre. 
early photographs are very was a bit complicated. What have we got here? We've got all these processes, including um, silver, hydrochloric acid, mercury vapor. Um, it's a bit dangerous. It's a bit difficult. And we do still have some of these early photographs surviving. I've got some of my family. But it also gives us a view of history, which is a bit of an odd view of history. If you think about Victorians, how many of you have in your mind that photographic image of a very suited or well-dressed Victorian gentleman or woman looking very serious at you from that photo? And that we're not amused kind of Queen Victoria view. Now I want to do something very simple in the remaining time that I've got. I would like you to imagine you're a Victorian and I would like you to smile for your Victorian photograph for one minute. Okay, stop clock starting and smile. And please hold the smile for a minute. Keep smiling, keep on smiling. Is it getting painful? Is it really quite difficult? I feel like I should have a ventriloquist dummy at this point standing next to me. It's there. Are your muscles beginning to ache a little bit at this point? Now, hold at that moment. Is anyone's jaw feeling slightly achy after that little bit of grinning? If you look at early Victorian photographs, the exposure in the very earliest photographs was up to 20 or 30 minutes. You cannot physically keep smiling for that point and look natural. Even the later photographs, the exposure was several minutes. If you look at the image I've got on screen now, this guy's head has been held in place with a vice behind to stop him moving and getting a blurred image as a result. Here is one of the unusual Victorian smiling photographs, which to me is slightly terrifying. <laughs> that's going to, that's there. Now, our view of the Victorians is because we've inherited a photograph. If you read Dickens novels, it's full of sad people, happy people, people living and having emotions like us. But this image is also important at the time because you are selling the image of the British Empire. And the stiff upper lip is saying, we've taken over your country, but made it better because we are organized, logical, we are improving things. And that photographic image you're selling is good PR as well. So the images we're taken, the images we're shown are saying something really interesting about the world around us. And we can see that in more modern photos. That's the reason why they were mounted. Here's some early images, very serious Victorian family because they are sitting there for minutes on end smiling. Or in this instance, here's a photograph of a Victorian photographer showing his photographs. Um, yes, a bit like modern day TV programs where you're watching someone watching TV, isn't it? It's good PR. As technology got faster, people started to do more interesting thing with photographs. This is fascinating. This is a dentist advertising his dentist. And you, you might be able to see, they've even put red color here. <laughs> Having said that, I have absolutely no idea what this Victorian person was trying to say about themselves or their life. It's fascinating. It's really weird. It's something else that's going on. Now, We've got very few images from the early 1800s. Here's a photo showing no photographs, 1826, increasing to a billion in 1930, 1990s, 57. Increasing number of photographs over time, interesting different things we do in photographs. Now that diagram is absolutely fine for the UK. If it was in America, it would do that in 1860. Why? What happened in the 1860s in America that led lots of people to say, I want a photograph more so than in Europe? Well, the answer to that question American is shown in the type of photographs. It's the American Civil War. And if 
my husband, son, or whoever was going off to war and might die, actually a photograph to remember them by is going to be quite useful. So we have lots of images from them. It's also interesting how they show themselves. To be honest, those bottom two photographs, I could see those person on the 6th of January invading the capital. Interestingly, it's also some of the non-white earliest photographs to be taken as well. And this scares me, is how old is this soldier? Or in this case, the daughter wearing mourning, holding the photograph of her father. There's something intriguing happening as part of this. So early photography is about capturing images of us, our place of the world around us. I'm now going to bounce through for five minutes, some different ways over time, people have used photographs to show their different geography and different things about the world around us. And then we'll look at the world now. Here's an example of a very early type of photography, which came through around about the 1850s, was cheaper, was better, produced really precise images, but never actually caught on. Cyanotypes produce these blue images. If you look at the detail here, it's tremendous for an early photograph. It's really quick to take, but no one did it because I'm quite happy with a brown photograph of myself and my family, but my family with a blue face looks a bit weird. This has survived to nowadays. If I take the word cyan, I could replace it with a different word. That word would be blue, blueprints, as in the photo prints of designs of buildings. It doesn't matter if the design of your plan is blue, it matters it's exact and precise. So people's attitudes determine technology as well. Early landscape photographs. This is the first landscape photograph taken in Paris in 1838 by Daguerre at the Boulevard de Temple of Prairie. But it's also the first known photograph of people. I don't know if you can just see down here. There is a man getting his shoes polished which meant they were both stationary for more than two minutes and everybody else as they were walking past were moving too quickly for the process to be photographed. That's intriguing. I love that. Documentary photography started in the 1860s because we had lighter cameras, quicker photographs and because people wanted to see other bits of the world, different geographies. This photograph is taken by a German photographer in 1860, uh, and this is in Brazil. The origins of what we now see in National Geographic, documenting our geography at a distance, different places. At the same time, people also use photographs to, geog to photograph the geography closer to home. This is the streets of Glasgow in 1868, and it was taken by Thomas Annan because they wanted people to see more about the poverty in the cities just next door to where their houses were. This is social reform because geography allows us to take an image, reproduce it and send it out for lots of people to see. That sharing of a common experience. We can see that in other images Anyone who knows who Charles Lutwidge Dodgson is? If I said Lewis Carroll, author of, which also a documentary photographer. This image is of Roginal Southey, who was a natural scientist who was involved in the 1860s in the debate of whether evolution and Darwin's origin of species was true or whether the world was created and the Bible was truth. Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859. Photography existed at that point. That's just mind blowing. But let's look at it. Notice it's not just the person, it's the person with a human skull, ape skulls, early hominid skulls. It's a photograph trying to tell a story. Look, we came from that to that to me. It's illustrating it. I showed you this moment, this photograph a minute ago, didn't I? 
It's also one of the early examples of photo manipulation. Can you see there's a difference of the color of the photograph here and the background? This person has cut out two images and put a view of the rainforest in front of someone standing in a studio. It's actually a cheat. It's photo manipulation. And in fact, the earliest photos and changing the world around us goes back to the 1840s. This is the delightfully named Hippolyte Bernard. Love it. And this is a photograph of, apparently of a drowned man, but it's actually him. So is photography showing us the truth of the geography around us or is it lying? Or is it trying to go hidden messages, hidden truths, hidden examples? What is it about? Well, we can look nowadays at photo manipulation. How many of you have seen these images where they've smoothed out the human body so much to look perfect, it looks like alien? Or indeed Kate Winslet's head on a different model's body. Or when Kerry, John Kerry was going for the American presidency, we stuck his head at a Vietnam rally or putting a Hitler moustache on someone. Photography has been used to lie about the world for many years through manipulation. Photography manipulation has also been used to tell truths. This is from the London 2050 competition about eight years ago, where people were asked to show London after global climate change. A manipulation of photographs is fine so long as it tells you the truth. It's not so fine when it is lying, it's hiding or seeking to deceive. So photography is about truth and different ways to truth. Photography is about globalization. It is about images going around the world. This is an early photograph of Billy the Kid. This is a photograph taken during the, in the USA, um, during slavery. Slavery was not abolished until 1862. Photographies existed showing the cruel mistreatment of trying to change people's attitudes. A couple more to show you, I know time's rushing on. Photography as a way of making the hidden worlds of geography visible. Here's an 1880 photograph or series showing movement of horses and proving at some point all the feet are off the ground. Scientific photography, this is the very first x-ray. It's actually the German scientist's wife and that's a wedding ring. Micro photography, showing hidden geography that's too small to see. Or the opposite, huge photography, NASA images of the planets. Apart from this is actually a lie. Um, they, it doesn't look like Star Trek out there. They've taken the whole wavelengths from ultraviolet, infrared, radio waves and made them, squash them into the visible spectrum. If we ever went into space, it'd be a bit duller than that. We complain it doesn't like Star Trek. Or modern days of showing the hidden world around us. This is bird flight, multiple images showing the patterns of flying of the birds around them that's there. Um, can you bear with me? I'm going to be about three more minutes longer. I apologise, I'm going to overrun just slightly. I got too enthusiastic. If you need to go, bye, sorry. So I started off that photography was about capturing images of pretty things, our family, distant places, holidays, etc. We still do that nowadays. But photography nowadays has very different functions and different ways. If you look at the numbers, 1920s, less than a billion, 1960s, three billion photographs. And that's because this thing, the box brownie, I got one somewhere, um, camera was cheap, cheerful, we could use. 1960, we've got color print. Here's a photograph of Newcastle High Street. 1960, three billion photographs, 1970, 10 billion. But that true print image for 36 prints being produced was £4.99. The film was 99p. 
And to put that price into context, here's a ticket for seeing Queen, the band, at Newcastle City Hall for £4.50. That on your phone costs you nothing. In the 1970s, it cost you a lot of money to take photographs, so you tend to only take certain views. And why are these images important? Because that's the first ever digital scan of a photo from 1957. That's the first ever photo taken with a digital camera in the 1980s. And this was the first photographic image shared on the web in the 1980s. That's a camera. It was recorded on a cassette. If you don't know what a cassette is, ask your parents. And this is increased photography and that's digital. So what does photography do now? It allows us to make copies of things in the world out there. It allows us to share those copies with others. It allows us to offer other people a view of the world as we see it. And it allows us to be Doctor Who, to abolish time and space, to go back in time and witness historic events, to go to faraway places we couldn't otherwise see. And as some people argue, to communicate with the world of the dead. Blimey, that's a bit heavy that's there. Photography allows us to see the world of geography out there but the world we share with people is based on our view in our own head. And as a result, it is about photography and the photographs you take. Are you telling me or your friends, or whoever you send that image to, about how you see the geography of your family, your friends, the places you live, the places you visit? You are documenting your geography. I could go on for hours. It may feel like it, but I'm going to stop. Thanks for letting me overrun a little bit. Any questions? Let's have a look in the chat. So if anyone's got any questions, if you put them in the chat now then, oh, Peter, that would be fabulous. Can I just say thank you very much, Peter? That was an absolutely fascinating talk. And the, the images, there's definitely not too many images there. We were all absolutely intriguing. Superb. So thank you very much. No problem at all. So if anyone's got any questions, if you put them in the chat now, that would be great. Just having a look. I'm not sure anybody's got any questions, actually, Peter. That's okay. I'm... That feels very comprehensive. So I think, oh, hang on, here we go. So from Daniel. Would you say that there are any benefits to geography in terms of using cloud storage, not just print? Yeah, um, provided that the technology that we use now survives in the future and is transferable and upgradable, then it allows us to save um, those images in perpetuity. Um, a print photograph will fade in bright light. It may be lost, it may be misfiled. Um, digital photographs also have electronic data attached to them, often the geographical location, the time. Whereas I've got photographs of relations and I've got no idea who the heck is in this wedding. Because the person who took it, they knew that family in 1920 or whatever that was there. Now the problem is though, anyone remember floppy disks? CD-ROMs? Anyone got in a cupboard CD-ROMs, but no CD-ROM player on the computer? In 20 years time, we may have got our stuff stored somewhere on a server, but the technology we use is crystals or something, we can't access it. It needs to be able to access and go backwards. So the answer is yes and no. Oh, instant photographs, brilliant. If you've got a daughter and an instant camera, um, give them a present of a free set of film of photographs and just ask them to take the images that they want to take and then sit down with them and have that question of why have you taken that? What's that image say to you? What's really careful? An 80p a picture is not cheap compared to nothing. 
Um, my youngest niece um, took 150 odd photographs one evening of a friend, all doing the same pose. They got the right one to post on Instagram. If it was 80p per picture, you would take less. Cloud is more affordable. Yep, it is more affordable completely. It's therefore potentially more global. Um, everyone perhaps has access to the web. It allows us to share. The potential benefits are brilliant, but it's also been an excuse to abolish documentary photography um, projects and therefore lose the more formal recording of the world around us. Brilliant. Let's go Any more questions, anyone? Well, I think on that note, Peter, thank you so much. That was a fantastic talk. Carl, I'm just wondering, sorry, if we could just swap the slides over, Peter, if you could just yeah. not take that off sharing. I'm wondering, yeah. Carl, if you can put the other slide on for us that's got the next talk, the talks on. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So this is the list of our upcoming talks. As you can see, our next talk is with uh, next week with James Kendall at four o'clock looking at enhancing your career with chartered geographer accreditation if anyone's interested in that that's obviously designed for anyone who's a geographer who's interested in trying to become a chartered geographer that's also if you're a teacher as well you can get chartered geography um, as a teacher um, and then obviously the other talks that are on here um, obviously please get in touch if you were interested in attending any of them so we can get the link then out to you um, I just want to know at the bottom our email addresses. So there's myself, Brenda and Amy on there. Um, if you're interested in a certificate, then I'll, if you can email me, it's Louise Marley Coburn at gmail.com um, and I will get you a certificate sent out. Um, and on that note, thank you very much, everybody, for attending our talk this evening. Thank you very much. And thanks uh, like again to Peter. That was a fabulous talk. Thank you so much.